Portia, I don't think this will surprise you, but I have a tendency when I walk into a room or we're in a meeting together at work or I show up at a family gathering and I just assume that everybody's mad at me or I'm going to make somebody mad before it's all said and done. (laughs) Do you ever feel that way? Oh, many times, my friend. The area that I experience it the most is probably my marriage. Mm. And so sometimes I'm afraid to ask Mikhail, like if I need something and it's like I don't want to annoy him or upset him. Because you think he might already be annoyed. Yes. At a deeper level, if we're operating from this idea that people are always mad at us, Mm -hmm. We are probably also operating from the idea that God is always mad oh, at yeah, us. Oh, yeah, that's exactly where it comes from. Welcome to The Deep Well with Erin Davis. I'm Portia Collins. Erin is currently in a series called In a Little While, and today she's going to be addressing the question, is God mad at me? Let's listen. Here's Erin. I don't remember much about sophomore English class, but I do remember when we got the assignment to read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It's an old sermon written by Jonathan Edwards. Now, what you need to know is that I was a brand new follower of Jesus. And I hadn't heard very many sermons at all. I certainly had never heard anybody preach in a style that could be described as fire and brimstone. On the page for our homework for that sermon, there was a drawing. It was in orange and black, and it showed silhouettes of people falling into hell. I was terrified. And as we were talking it through, my English teacher told me that when Jonathan Edwards preached that sermon, women fainted. It was scary. And I could see why women fainted when I actually jumped into the reading assignment Here's a snippet of what I read. Yea, God is a great deal more angry with great numbers that are now on earth. Yea, doubtless, with many that are now in this congregation, who it may be are at ease than he is with many of those who are now in the flames of hell. Yee! I wanted to go back to reading Charlotte's Web. God used that sermon to ignite the Great Awakening, and I'm not questioning its merit, but to a 15-year-old new follower of Jesus who was just learning my way around the Bible, just the words, angry God, were scary to me. And I wondered if what Jonathan Edwards said was true of me, that God was as angry with me as a new Christian as he was with people who were already in hell. I don't think there was ever a time when I didn't believe in God. I've never really questioned his existence, but I have had questions, lots of questions about his character. You know, we all have different personalities. We can take zillions of personality assessments that'll tell us where we are on some chart and what our personality is related to an animal or a plant. And we're all different from each other in that way. And it's part of my personality, for better or worse, that I just assume everyone is mad at me. And I know that sounds silly. When I say it out loud, I feel silly about it, but it is true. My baseline assumption is that I have, or I'm going to, do something to frustrate you. And so my baseline assumption about God, certainly as a new follower of Jesus and a teenager, for many, many years afterwards, is that he was always mad at me too. We're working through a series in the deep well on God and time. And the way we're doing that is that we're looking for the phrase in a little while in our Bibles. In this episode, we're going to find it twice in the book of Isaiah. It's in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 25, and Isaiah chapter 29, verses 17 through 24. Let me read us those passages. Isaiah 10, 25. For in a very little while, my fury will come to an end, and my anger will be directed to their destruction. Let me flip to Isaiah 29, 17 through 21, and then we'll connect these dots. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exalt in the Holy One of Israel. 
For the ruthless shall come to nothing, and the scoffer cease. And all who watch to do evil shall be cut off, who by a word make a man out to be an offender, and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate, and with an empty plea turn aside from him who is in the right. Again, let's do a little background check. If you listen to episode one in this series, we talked about Haggai. He was an Israelite and a prophet. He returned to Jerusalem from captivity. And God used Haggai to call his people to rebuild the temple. And he promised, I'm going to refill that temple with my glory in a little while. Well, we have to rewind in our Bibles a little bit for this episode. And young listeners of the deep well, I love you. I am so glad you're here. You really are the reason that the deep well exists. I want you to fall in love with your whole Bible. But for now, I need to tell you about a wonder of my childhood. We had a whole device dedicated to rewinding our VHS tapes. We rented our VCR and videos from the video store on the weekend, and we had to return those tapes rewound. Well, that wasn't a problem because we had a VHS rewinder. You'd put the tape in, you'd press rewind, and it took about three minutes. Bingo! Your tape was rewound. And we didn't have to hold down the rewind button the whole time. We thought it was amazing. So let's rewind from Haggai to Isaiah. And I'm glad we talked about Haggai first because there's some connecting points. Isaiah was also an Israelite. And the first several chapters of the book of Isaiah's message is that God's people must repent of their idolatry. And that if they didn't, they would be invaded and taken captive. That should ring some bells because they did not repent. And midway through the book, Jerusalem was under siege. And by the end of the book, God's people were in exile. Now, the book of Isaiah is complex. I would never try to boil it down to a single podcast episode, and it has a lot of important themes in it. It prophesies about Jesus multiple places. You've probably heard the book of Isaiah read at Christmas. And one of the themes is God's judgment. God is holy, and God is just, and God has every right to judge and punish sin in our lives. And we see that. Throughout the book of Isaiah, God's people were, in fact, idol worshipers. And they were, in fact, given opportunities to repent, and they did not. But God is also merciful. He is full of grace. And judgment and mercy go hand in hand with him. We see this in Isaiah 10, 24 through 27. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrians when they strike with the rod and lift up their staff against you as the Egyptians did. For in a very little while, my fury will come to an end and my anger will be directed to their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will wield against them a whip as when he struck Midian at the rock of Oreb and his staff will be over the sea and he will lift it as he did in Egypt. And in that day, his burden will depart from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be broken because of the fat. Did you hear the phrase, in a little while? It was right there in verse 25. In a very little while, my fury will come to an end. Now, God spoke these words through the prophet Isaiah while he was calling his children to repentance. So, Even as he told them, I am going to deal with your sin. He also told them, but I will not stay mad forever. Here's a lesson about God that in a little while teaches us in the book of Isaiah. The timeline of God's anger is very short. The timeline of God's grace is very, very long. Now, I'm a parent of four boys, and if you listen to the deep well, you already know that because you won't hear me teach very often without bringing up my sons, Eli, Noble, Judah, and Ezra. They are my delight. I love to talk about them. And they also provide lots of teaching illustrations. So when I read the words of the prophet Isaiah, what I hear there is parenting language. Let's read verses 24 and 25 again. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, be not afraid of Assyria when they strike with the rod and lift up their staff against you as the Egyptians did. For in a very little while, my fury will come to an end and my anger will be directed at their destruction. Strike the rod. That's a parenting phrase. The Israelites were, in a sense, about to get a spanking. And this one was going to sting. The Assyrians were a wicked and violent people, as were the Babylonians who would eventually capture them. But God said, don't be afraid of this punishment. Not because it's not going to hurt. It is. But because it's only going to last for a little while. I hope my sons know that about me. I've never asked them, but I hope they know without a shadow of a doubt that I may need to spank them, to teach them that disobedience has consequences, but I will never, ever keep spanking them. I hope that thought's never even occurred to them. It's never happened, but I hope they know this is going to hurt, but it's only going to last for a little while. There's times when I need to sit my boy down on the stairs so he can think about how he treated me or how he treated his brothers. But he knows when I sit him on the stairs, he already knows he's not going to have to stay there very long. God was giving his children confidence that he's that kind of parent. And here in Isaiah 10, what we see to be true about how God parented the Israelites in this moment in history is still true for how God parents us. Fast forward to Isaiah 29, 17 through 24. The way we got there is that for chapter after chapter, Isaiah wrote about God's wrath against the nations, against Israel, and some of it feels really scary. Listen to Isaiah 24, 6. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are scorched, and few men are left. You know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like that picture in my sophomore English textbook. And when we get gut level honest, we know we've earned it. Just like God's people in Isaiah's day, we chase after idols. And ours are American idols. Mine is comfort. I'm always comfort seeking. I will prioritize comfort over almost anything else in my flesh. And I don't know what your idols are. Maybe it's not comfort. And I could list a bunch of possibilities of what it might be, but you don't need me to. Because you know what your idols are. If you are a follower of Jesus and you have the Holy Spirit living in you, he is always calling you to turn from vain idols. And why? Why is God always calling us away from our idols? Why didn't the Israelites turn from their idols when they knew the result of failing to repent was going to be so horrific? Well, we are broken people. And we live on a broken planet. And because of that, we are always going to face a gravitational pull toward idols. Until we're with Jesus in glory. And because we are always going to face that gravitational pull. And because we can't shed our sin nature. We can operate even if we don't know it. Even if we're not conscious of it. From the sense that God is always mad at us. And for me, I find it hard to worship a God who I think is always mad at me. I can cower, I can avoid, but worship him if he's always mad at me? And what about serving him? I I might do it begrudgingly because I don't want him to be more mad at me. But serving him with a happy heart when I think he's always mad at me, I can't. I go back to the analogy of my kids. You know, that's what families are. They are a way for us to understand the way that we relate to God and God relates to us and the way we relate to each other. And I don't want my children just to obey me because they think I'm always going to be mad at them or because they fear my anger, because they love me. And they know I delight in them. 
And that is an important heart shift that I get out of these passages in Isaiah. When we feel like God is always mad at us, we need the a little while found in Isaiah 29. Let me read you Isaiah 29, 17 through 20 again. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exalt in the Holy One of Israel. For the ruthless shall come to nothing, and the scoffer cease, and all who watch to do evil shall be cut off. Hold that thought. Flip back to Isaiah 10 for just a moment. Listen to verses 33 through 34. Behold, the Lord God of hosts will lop the boughs with terrifying power. The great and height shall be hewn down and the lofty will be brought low. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with an axe and Lebanon will fall by the majestic one. Isaiah 10 gives us a picture of the judgment of God. In Isaiah 29, he's promising restoration. In his judgment, God destroyed the mighty trees of Lebanon, through enemy invaders. Now, something you should know about me is that my dream is to see the sequoias. I want to stand at the base of those trees, and I want to feel my insignificance. I love them so much. I have pictures of the sequoias on my desk. I have a T-shirt from Sequoia National Park, even though I've never been there. It is the one and only item on my bucket list. And so I cannot fathom an enemy army coming in and destroying Sequoia National Forest. But that's what God let happen here in Lebanon. Do you know how long it takes a giant sequoia to grow? I know because I'm obsessed with them. It takes 50 years for a giant sequoia to grow 100 feet. If I planted one in my backyard, I wouldn't live to see it become a giant. Most of the trees in Sequoia National Park are more than 3,000 years old. And here, in Isaiah 29, God's saying, in a very little while, that place of destruction will become a fruitful field. How can that be? These giant trees of Lebanon, which we see other places in Scripture, had been destroyed. And God is saying, in a little while, there will be fruit there again. And also in Isaiah 29, we read that those who could not see and hear the word of God, they were blinded, they were made deaf by their sin. And the promise here is that suddenly we're going to get it. In a little while, God's going to unstop our ears. He's going to uncover our eyes. In this passage in Isaiah 29, it promises fresh joy in the Lord. Worship reignited. What's going on? What does it all mean? I think we could read the Bible one of two ways. We could read it as an endless string of God's anger. There was judgment at the garden. There was judgment at the flood. There's judgment here in the prophets. There's judgment in the book of Revelation. And that's one view of time. But the full view that scripture gives us is one of all human history covered in God's grace. Where there are moments where God's righteous anger was justified, but it didn't last long. Both in Isaiah 10 and in Isaiah 29, one word gets added to the phrase in a little while. Did you catch it? Go back and read it. See if you can find it. The word is very. The timeline of God's anger is very short. The timeline of his grace is very, very long. Listen to Psalm 30, 4 through 5. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Now, this tells us something that's really important. God's anger is short for a little while, 
for his saints. For those of us who are in Christ, we can know that God's anger will not last forever. For those who are not in Christ, his anger does last forever. But for those of us who know God, who follow Jesus, this is what the psalmist says. Sing praise to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. How long does God's anger last? But for a moment. In other words, just for a little while. In contrast, what about his favor? What about his grace? What about his love? What about his mercy? They last for a lifetime. In fact, they last beyond our lifetime. Heaven is a place where we will finally be free of sin and where we will no longer need God's wrath to correct us. And that is what time is moving us toward. As you're listening to this series, I hope you're rethinking timelines. I hope you're getting some new mental images for the way that time works according to God's word. And here's one for you, a word picture of one long, never-ending timeline of God's grace. It has no beginning. It has no end. It just goes on and on and on and on and on and on. That really is the timeline of our lives. That really is what we see here in Isaiah, that even as God is promising judgment, and even as the judgment is being handed down, and even right after the judgment has been handed down and the land is destroyed, God is saying, this is only going to last for a little while. It's only going to last for a little while because the purpose of God's judgment is not to squash us, but to call us back to him. But it's true that on the timeline of our lives, there are dashes where God is angered by our sin. And in his mercy, he does not permit us to stay in that sin. But it doesn't make me a good parent to let my boys disobey me. It's not going to lead to their flourishing, to let them behave any way they want to, because they have a sin nature too. So I hope that if they could make a timeline of their life with me, there would be one long timeline of my love and my grace and my mercy and my goodness to them, and there would be little dashes where I got angry and I needed to discipline them. God's anger, it has a purpose. And the purpose of God's anger is to redirect us toward that long line of his grace. But God is not mad at you all the time. Judgment has a limited time, just a dash. Grace extends without limit. I was teaching at a women's conference once, several years ago, and man, we were singing our hearts out. And there was a woman playing the keyboard, and suddenly she stopped playing, and she said into her microphone, God's not mad at you. And hot tears that I didn't know were there started to sting at the corners of my eyes, and they sting at the corners of my eyes now when I tell that story. And honestly, I wasn't sure how I felt. What I thought was God might be mad at some of us. God might be mad at me. You got to remember that was my baseline, that God was always mad at me. Several years later, I was teaching at another women's conference, and there was that same worship leader. And I said, do you remember when we did that event together in Nashville? And she said, I do. She said, that was the strangest thing. I just felt this urge to say, God's not mad at you. And those hot tears came back into the corners of my eyes, and I said, I remember. She told me stories of how women at that conference came up to her and shared how much they needed to hear that. I wasn't the only one with hot tears. You know, if we see history as one long story of God's anger, we live in fear. I can't read the Bible 
and say that God will never be angry. But I can look at what's happening here in Isaiah, and I can say with confidence, because of God's word, he will not stay angry. That's what he says in Isaiah 10. In a very little while, my fury will come to an end. As followers of Jesus, are we sinners in the hands of an angry God? Maybe. For a moment. Are we sinners in the hands of a gracious God? Always. 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 You know, before we say goodbye in this episode, there's one more passage of scripture we need to read from the book of Isaiah. It comes from Isaiah 53, 5 through 6. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. There's a reason you can know with confidence that God's not always mad at you. And it's not because you don't deserve it. This passage tells us we're all like sheep running in glad rebellion from the Lord. But because God the Father put on to Jesus the Son the punishment, the anger, the chastisement that we deserved. And his anger was satisfied so that it's true. His anger really does only last for a little while. But his mercy, it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. That's Erin Davis, and she is sharing the most beautiful, wonderful message that any of us could ever hear, the gospel of Jesus Christ. All too often, we forget that the Bible is saturated with gospel truths from the beginning to the end. And what I love about one of Aaron's most recent studies, it's Seven Feasts, Finding Christ in the Sacred Celebrations of the Old Testament, is that guess what? This study takes you right to the heart of the gospel. So I encourage you to check it out. If you want to grab a copy, visit reviveourhearts.com slash the deep well. Okay, it's time for Aaron Unscripted. And Aaron, I have a question, or maybe it's a thought. So how does the gospel help us to really see God in the true light of who he is, as opposed to big old mean, he's mad at me, angry God? Well, the gospel is the point where that changes. God doesn't change, Mm. but... You can't read the Bible and not think God is ever angry. He does get angry. And rightfully about something. And rightfully Mm. so. So the way to look at God's character is not to say, oh, he's always happy. I can't do anything wrong. I've never made him angry by my sin. No, that's not true. But what the gospel teaches us is that God's wrath was satisfied in Christ. Mm -hmm. So God's not mad at me anymore. Because all of that anger was put on Christ. Christ took my punishment, including Mm -hmm. God's anger, and it's been satisfied. So for me to continue to be like, are you mad at me, God? Are you mad at me, God? Are you mad at me, God? God's mad at me, God. Are you mad at me, God? Jesus took that on. I need to put those gospel lenses back on and say, yes, my sin is offensive to God. Yes, it does make him angry. But his anger was satisfied by Christ's sacrifice. Amen. I struggled tremendously with, honestly, just an assurance that God loved me. Mm. I had put this weight and this pressure on myself to be this and to, you know, basically my idea of love was conditional. I felt like God only loved me if I was able to do this or if I was able to be this type of person. And so it made me literally terrified, terrified of death, terrified Mm -hmm. of hell, terrified of God. And hearing the gospel over and over, we could we could never grow old of hearing the gospel. But hearing it over and over, 
it's like a balm to my soul. It is the truth that I need to hear to help me rightly understand who God is and how, as you said, yes, our sin is offensive and anger is a just response to that. But we have a beautiful Savior who has taken on the wrath of God. For so his he's sake, not for our sake. less angry at you or love you more because you got better, mm-hmm. you know, or because you're doing better at X, Y, Z, or you stop sinning at this, although he certainly calls us to stop sinning. But because who he is is to be merciful and displayed in the gospel. Yes. I Sometimes I feel a little insecure as a Bible teacher because it does not matter what I'm teaching on. I'm going to point it to the gospel. Same. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I just feel like I'm teaching the same lesson over and over, but I'm using a different passage. But that really is the lens through which I see mm-hmm. Scripture, and it really is the lens that makes a difference in my life. Mm. You know, one thing that I hear people say often is they get tired of reading about the God of the Old Testament, Mm. the angry God. Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, yes. Honestly, I love all parts of Scripture, and I don't see now, at one point I did, but now I don't see the God of the Old Testament apart from the God of the New Testament or, or separate. It's the same God with the same emotions. It's just... Where we are in the story, we kind of get to view things through a different lens. I hope right, that makes and sense. I part of it also is how do we respond to that word anger? I mean, mm. we just want to throw that whole emotion out. That's a bad emotion. Nobody should ever feel anger. Mm-hmm. Well, Scripture says in the New Testament, "Be angry and do not sin." Mm-hmm. So, meaning anger in itself is not a sinful emotion. Correct. I'm sure you can think of some times, but there are times when anger is a right response. Mm -hmm. You know, when we see an injustice, um, when we see somebody being abused, we should be angry. And that is the kind of anger we're seeing displayed. Why do you think you were able to make the shift from however many years or however long that was of seeing a dichotomy? Like these are two different gods and two different testaments to now it feeling like one picture of one God. What happened? I stopped viewing scripture as disjointed pieces and it it really became one story of God's faithfulness to sinful humans. And so we see as I, I began to look and I see God's response to sin, I see why he responds this way because of his holiness. It's not because he's just trying to be big old mean God. I see why his mercy is his mercy because of our inability to do anything to save ourselves. So it's like I began to see the wholeness or the fullness of who God is just by looking at the entire story, the entire story of redemption. Yeah. So one of the things or the message that we see coming from many of the prophets of the Old Testament, they are hard, you know, fire and brimstone, angry messages. But I think it's so important for us to look at why Mm -hmm. and what God is calling out in his people that's wrong, that's causing or prompting this emotion of anger. And so, you know, there was injustice going on with widows and orphans and the oppressed being taken and the poor and the poor correct and then like we we see the spiritual apathy and things like that and so god's response to these things is actually when we really think about it they're the very things that we kind of we don't like to see anybody right and we live in this advocate culture Mm -hmm. you know you're Mm -hmm. supposed to have a cause Mm -hmm. and you're supposed to advocate for it I'm not knocking that necessarily, but Mm -hmm. there's a part of us that really resonates with justice Mm -hmm. and advocating for those who can't advocate for themselves, but resists God's anger. And God wasn't just being mad to be mad. Right. It was part of his, his justice. So when we see God being angry, what we really should understand is it's, it's not anger without cause or without validity. God's anger is really a part of his justice. Right. And 
he he calls us to the carpet on that mm-hmm. in areas where we have done wrongly, where we have not been merciful to our brother or sister, where we have, you know, failed to care for the widow or the orphan. Yeah, we don't ever see him getting hangry, you know, just <laughs> right. mad at us because he needs some protein, right. or we don't ever see him getting angry just to throw his weight around. Mm-hmm. His anger is directed toward our sin. And so we could interchange the word justice for right. anger. Absolutely. But we'd land at the same place, which is that his justice, his dealing with our sin, doesn't last forever and ever. Mm-hmm. He dealt with it on the cross. And so his mercy, his grace is what is that long timeline that keeps extending. So you talked about walking into a room and assuming that everybody is mad at you, not pleased with you. How does the gospel change your your heart in that regard or reshape your thinking? Well, there's a little phrase that I say to myself a lot. I don't know if I thought it up or I read it somewhere, but it has become an important part of the way I operate in the world. And it's this, Jesus, I will measure your love by the cross and your power by the resurrection. Mm. So, My feelings are really inconsequential. They're neither good nor bad, or sometimes they're good or sometimes bad. But I'm not going to use them to measure how Jesus feels about me anymore because I can know he loves me because he went to the cross for me. Amen. And I can know he has the power to save me from my sin because he rose from the grave. And I'm not over-spiritualizing things, I don't think, to say that that also changes how I interact with people. Mm -hmm. Because I am secure in Christ. I really am. Most of the time, I even feel secure in Christ. And so I can walk into a room and not have to worry about what other people may or may not think about me. And also know that everybody in that room needs the gospel. So if they are mad at me, Mm -hmm. that is something that we could work out or the Lord could work in our hearts about or it is something that we can let go of because it has nothing to do with anything of real significance. So I do have a confidence in Christ that changes the way I relate to people. So Aaron, tell me what good stuff can we expect to hear on the next episode? Well, Jesus actually said the phrase that we've been tracing in a little while and we're going to find out what he meant. The Deep Well is a production of Revive Our Hearts, calling women to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ. When it comes to knowing God's will, Stacy Rudolph says it's helpful to compare ourselves with a Wi-Fi device. You have to position yourself and make sure you're in a place to hear from God, because God is always downloading things. But are you in a place that you can hear it and receive it? What interrupts so. the frequency? Sin is yeah. huge, huge, huge. Right. Hear more on the Women of the Bible podcast. Subscribe to Women of the Bible wherever you listen to podcasts or visit ReviveOurHearts.com slash Women of the Bible.